Well, good morning, everybody. Oh, it's good to be back. It's good to see you all this morning, even if the temperature dropped 50 degrees the last time I was here. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> don't, don't be applauding for that. Uh, ah, it's good to be with you. Um, I'm blessed to be with you this morning. Uh, for those who are new or just joining us or don't quite remember who I am, uh, my name is John Hoppel. I'm the worship coordinator here at Zion. And I don't have any announcements this morning, but we're going to do something special this morning. We are sending off uh, a staff member who's been with us for a number of years, Kyla Watson, and we're bringing someone new into the fold. So without further ado, come on down. Good morning, church. Uh, my name is Ashley Dirksen. I am your treasurer, and I also assist at Z Kids. And so we just wanted to um, send Kyla off. Um, so Kyla is our communications, or was our communications director, um, and she is retiring from Zion to be a full-time stay-at-home mom, which is very exciting. Um, so Kyla, we have this gift for you. Thank you. And then we also want to take this time to welcome Laura and introduce Laura. So Laura is our new communications director. So all forms of communication will be running through Ly or Laura. Sorry, I was going to say Lila. <laughs> I'm just going to mix them both and we'll call them Lila. Laura. Um, so well, let's go ahead and pray for them. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for just the gift and joy that Kyla has brought to this church um, to the, our community. She's always one to welcome everyone with such a warm smile, a friendly and upbeat attitude, and is so helpful with all of our needs. Uh, we pray for her future endeavors um, with farm life and raising kids, God, that you would just be in and amongst all of those things, that uh, she would be blessed by you greatly. We pray for Laura as she steps into this role, that we can um, encourage her and support her and be patient with her as she steps in and is learning new things. Um, God, we thank you just for the role of the communications person, that they are really the voice of our church. Um, they're the ones that are creative and coming up with uh, all of the words that help push vision, that help um, stir something in our hearts, that move us closer to you, God, that they are the ones that create all of the visuals that make something look so fun and exciting to go to and to check out. Um, they're the ones that we get our information from. And so they're important, God. We thank you for them, for their role, for their creativity. And we just ask a blessing in both of them. Lord, it is in your name we pray. Amen. And then let's sing our opening hymn together. Savior, with your love our spirits fill. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's take a moment of silence for reflection and self-examination. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you, and for his sake, God forgives you all your sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Our God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. 
Beloved God, from you come all things that are good. Lead us by the inspiration of your Spirit to know those things that are right. And by your merciful guidance, help us to do them. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first lesson this morning comes to us from the fifth chapter of the book of Isaiah, beginning with verse 1. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I am going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. Today's responsive reading comes to us from Psalm 80. Let us read it responsively together by half verse. Restore us, God Almighty. Make your face shine upon us. That we may may be be saved. saved. You're transplanted a vine from Egypt. You drove drove out out the the nations nations and planted planted it. it. You cleared the ground for it. And it took took root root and and filled filled the land. land. The mountains were covered with its shade. The The mighty mighty cedars cedars with with its its branches. branches. Its branches reached as far as the sea. Its Its shoots as as far as as the river. river. Why have you broken down its walls? so So that that all who pass by pick pick its grapes. Boars from the forest ravage it, and And insects insects from the fields feed on it. Return to us, God Almighty. Look down from the heaven and see. Watch Watch over over this vine. The root to your right hand has planted. The The sun you have have raised up for yourself. yourself. Your vine is cut down. It is burned with fire. At At your your rebuke, your people people perish. perish. Let your hand rest on the man at your right hand, the The son son of man man you have raised raised up for yourself. Then we will not turn away from you. Revive Revive us, and and we we will call call on your name. name. Restore us, Lord God Almighty. Make your face shine on us, that that we may be saved. Our second lesson this morning is from the third chapter of the book of Philippians, beginning with verse 4. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, 
not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Here ends the reading. Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 21st chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruits. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first. And the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir, come. Let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. Give to our God
This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Well, good morning to all of you. It's good to see everybody again. We are launching into a brand new series starting today called Holy, Holy. And no, I'm not repeating myself. Holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y. Holy, H-O-L-Y. Pretty fun, huh? (laughs) You know it's going to be good if I have to spell out the title. (laughs) Well, coming off of last week, when we finished looking at all the ways where God provides for us, ways in which he helps us to become more like his son Jesus, we asked the question, how do we do that? What does it look like to become more like Christ? Now, we'll be going to be looking at how and why God cares about not just your spiritual life, but your whole life. All of it, who you are, matters to God. I just want to start this morning off with a question. If I were to ask you, how's your spiritual life doing? How's your faith? Many of us, including myself, would probably answer something like this. Well, am I, am I praying? Am I spending time in God's Word? Am I in community with other believers? Am I serving in the church? Now, these are all spiritual things. These are all good things. And our whole series that we just concluded on how we become who Jesus wants us to become, he gives us four gifts to do these things. His word, his spirit, his people, and his voice through prayer. Now, (laughs) obviously these things matter. These things are spiritual, but here's what can happen. Without realizing it, it's easy to fall into a trap that Satan has set up for so many of God's people since the very beginning. And the trap is this. We can begin to think of life in two big categories. There's the spiritual stuff, and then there's everything else. When the spiritual becomes things like prayer, church, reading your Bible, you start to create a separation between them and everything else. And when you put up this divide in your mind where things are either spiritual or they're not, this carries an even greater risk that can lead us into another trap, this one even more dangerous than the first. Believing that God only cares about the spiritual and not the everything else. The belief that God only cares about you if you're praying, if you're reading your Bible, if you're going to church, if you're worshiping and singing together. But he could care less about the other parts of your life, your job, your health, other habits, everything else. It's not quite as important. And this is not new. It's not a new trap. We can actually see it in the early church. In the first few centuries of Christianity, when it was new and starting to develop and starting to branch out and more and more people were hearing about it, there was an incredibly popular religion and philosophy that was taking root in the early church that sounds super Christian. If you listen to it at face value, you might go, oh yeah, I can believe that. Makes sense to me. But (laughs) dig a little deeper and you find that it is not what Jesus taught. In truth, 2,000 years later, here and now, we're still falling for it. This philosophy you might have heard of is called Gnosticism. The Gnostics taught that things of the flesh, the body, well, those are inherently bad. But things of the spirit, and not necessarily the Holy Spirit, but just the spiritual realm, those things are by nature good. This philosophy held that all the earthly stuff, this flesh, it was imperfect, not as good as what was spiritual. Ah, yes, enlightened, above everything else. And the more spiritual you were, the closer you were to God, the, the secret knowledge you gained to become closer to God. Now, this might sound a little bit out there, like, okay, well, yeah, they might have believed that back then, but that's not really the same here and now. 
When I was first going to college, I joined a college ministry group on campus called The Navigators. And I was excited because it was fun. I was doing it with my friends. It was a place to go to throughout the school year where I could learn and grow in my relationship with Christ. And I wanted to really take it seriously. So I joined what they called J-Team, Joshua Team, in reference to Joshua from the Bible. Joshua 1.9 was our central verse that we focused around. Have I not told you, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. We were given that verse, and I, you know, I've heard it before, and I liked it. But I didn't realize how much they really wanted us to apply that. You see, one of the things that we were challenged to do as part of our walk with God, as part of our growing in ministry and leadership, is they challenged us, go out on campus, just walk around, find some people, and share with them your faith. What? (laughs) You want me to, to walk up to a random stranger and share my faith with them? Are you nuts? Evidently, they, they thought I was nuts <laughs> because they pushed it. They said, try it, go. Okay, well, that's not really in my nature, but I'll give it a shot. So I walked around on campus and eventually I found a few people and after walking by their table like four times, I finally went up to them and offered to share my faith. I got some... <laughs> funny reactions from a few people and there was one guy in particular it was hilarious i sat down i said hey can i share with you about jesus can i share with you a little bit about my faith and he says oh well i'm actually a part of this ministry on campus and i was like really funny enough i'm actually a part of uh, this ministry on campus and our conversation turned from one of sharing my faith to just talking about our experience on campus and in ministry life. It took me a little bit, but I finally got into it, and I finally started becoming a little bit more comfortable with that. But something weird happened. As I spent more time in ministry, as I spent more time with the navigators, all of my time was being focused towards these spiritual things going out on campus and sharing my faith, coming to the worship nights every Thursday. These things aren't bad, and they were enjoyable. I got to do them with friends that I saw. But something happened where they became the focus of what I was doing at school, to the exclusion of everything else. My other extracurricular activities, my other friends that I had on campus, and most importantly, my classes, the things that, you know, I was actually there for. I saw those things as less important, as, well, well, yeah, I mean, they're good, but God is important. God would want me to do these spiritual works. He would want me to go out and share my faith. And yeah, so what? If I miss a class or two, who cares? I mean, it's all in service of God's kingdom, right? Well, the thing I wanted to share, this dichotomy, this split that's happening, where the spiritual is separate from everything else, we can see evidence of this in everyday life, here and now. Christians can say things like, well, my job's not nearly as important as yours is, John. I mean, you're doing soul work. I mean, you're saving people for Jesus. I'm just a fill-in-the-blank a teacher, a businessman. Or how about even people who serve in our church? Well, I'm, what I'm doing isn't really that important. I mean, I'm just serving coffee. <laughs> I'm just helping in kids' ministry or even just greeting people at the door. That's not really that important. I'm not preaching or leading worship or praying. You probably didn't realize it, but this is the lie of Gnosticism at work. But the real nastiness looks like this. At its worst, 
Gnosticism can teach that the only thing that truly matters is the spiritual. So what you do with your body doesn't really matter all that much. You can do whatever you want. And when we think the spiritual is all that matters, well, we can wrongly believe that God doesn't really care about the other aspects of our life. As if all it means to be a follower of Jesus is that you pray and read your Bible and go to church and that's it. This bleeds into all the other parts of who and how God made you as a human being. Physically, emotionally, mentally, relationally. When Gnosticism runs rampant, we end up with situations where the good of the kingdom is placed before the good of the individual. Many people have been hurt by those who were very spiritual or religious, but just didn't see the value in the person. They might have thought that the pain they caused was, was worth it because, well, God's kingdom work is being done. And if we're not careful, we can become like the Pharisees in our gospel lesson today who were doing religious work, upholding the law and all of the commandments rather than the soul care that needed to be done. The soul care that Jesus was doing. I say all of this to say that God cares about all of you. And this means he cares about your body, your mind, your mental and emotional health. He cares about your finances. He cares about your relationships. All of these things matter to God because really, all of these things are spiritual. Spiritual equals physical, emotional, plus mental, plus financial, plus every aspect of your life. There's nothing in your life that's not spiritual. This means that if your marriage is struggling, it's a spiritual issue. Going to counseling can be holy work. A, a solid counselor is doing God's work in the world. This is true for business owners. You might say, well, my business isn't doing anything life-changing. I mean, I love what I do, but it's not like Jesus is using me for anything big. But what about the people that you employ? Or the people that you serve, the, the clients and the customers that come in. There are ways to serve like Jesus would. If you're a teacher, you're caring for children's minds, bodies, and souls, this is spiritual work. And this is where I can fall into a trap. I can look for the big, life-changing, truly worshipful things and desire those at the cost of the things God is calling me to here and now. As a worship leader, I often look around and I see very talented worship teams and worship ministries like Elevation Worship or Bethel or Hillsong. A lot of these big name worship leaders that have countless videos and songs that they've uploaded and shared. Worship leaders of the highest skill and talent with lights and colors and music, the likes of which I can only dream about. And my heart desires that kind of impact. My heart looks at the videos they've produced, the, the quality they produce them at, and the, the millions of people that like and watch those videos, and goes, I want what they have. I want to do what they're doing. I want to be on the stage like they're on the stage. It doesn't hurt that they have the best of the best, best musicians, best technology, you name it, they probably have it. But as I sit there and I think about this, and as God is challenging me in this idea, how is that worship any better than singing hymns together? How is that any less spiritual to lead worship in small town Iowa? It isn't. And don't get me wrong, I'm still going to give my best in worship. I believe that God deserves our best in worship, our our full self. But God doesn't care about grand displays of spirituality. God doesn't care about the millions of likes that you get on a video. God only cares for the heart of the one worshiping. And the things that we can think of as small or insignificant, things that happen throughout our day, in God's eyes and in view of his kingdom, well, those things might have eternal significance. 
the little things that we do throughout our day, the, the things that I can just brush off or take for granted or think, well, this isn't really that important. I mean, <laughs> God can't use this. Well, God used several loaves and two fish to multiply and feed thousands of people. So, you know, there's just a couple examples in Scripture of God using the small acts of faith to produce incredible returns. Incredible miracles. As we look at what God is doing in our lives and these traps that we fall into, there's another one that can creep up as we're thinking about this split between spiritual and everything else. Trap number three is that we can minimize the devil's effectiveness. Let me read from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. From 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 3 and 4, Paul says this, But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. See, Satan first showed his plan to Eve, how he operates in Genesis 3.1. See, God told Adam and Eve they had a few responsibilities in the Garden of Eden. Tend to the garden. Expand creation and culture. Bring God's desire of beauty into the world. Go, be fruitful and multiply. Every tree in the garden is yours. But do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was it. But listen to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Satan isolates Eve and asks the one question that trips so many of us up. Did God really say you should not eat from the tree? That right there, that's, that's his modus operandi. That's, that's how he operates. Did God really say? This is at the heart of the devil's schemes to get in the way of God's people their wholeness, and their holiness. And it started from day one. Paul goes on to say in 2 Corinthians, for if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel from the one that you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. What does it mean? to preach a different gospel, to receive a different gospel. Well, in short, any gospel different from the one that teaches salvation through Christ alone, by grace, through faith, eh, that's not one we want to look to. That's not one we want to follow. But also, a gospel that preaches Jesus only wants a piece of you your spiritual acts. I believe that one of Satan's greatest schemes is getting us as Christians to believe that how you treat your body, your mind, your emotions, your relationships, your finances, your job, that's somehow less important to God than your prayer life, your scripture reading, or your church life. And I also believe that if we take any one of these pieces, any one of these areas, and we focus on it to the exclusion of everything else, we run into some troubles there too. This is a lie. In the Gospel of Mark, we can see this shown pretty well, that God doesn't care just about one piece of us, one part of our lives. You see, Jesus is going about as he always does, teaching and preaching. And one of the things the religious leaders were trying to do was trap Jesus with his words. They were trying to get him to speak against God's law so that they could label him a false teacher or a false prophet. Or, if they couldn't get him to do that, they tried to get him to speak out against Rome so that the Roman government would deal with him. And they didn't tend to mess around. In Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 34, we read this. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating and noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. That's my favorite part of the verse, I think. Just the mic drop moment. No one else was like, I can't follow that. I guess we're done. All right, let's wrap it up and go home. And Jesus sums up the heart of God's law by quoting from Deuteronomy 6. The Shema. This hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Something that every Jew in the vicinity would have instantly known what he was talking about. It would have been like the Lord's prayer to us. We've said it so many times, we've recited it so many times that it's just burned into our brains. Jesus says this, this is what matters. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's the thing. God cares about it all. And he gave us the gifts of his word, his spirit, his people, his his voice to help us to wholly become who God wants us to be. Last but not least, and I share this to remind us that God's grace and mercy and love and most importantly the good news of Jesus is for us. See, the gospel is not you must become like Jesus so you can be saved. Rather, it is because of your faith in Jesus you are already saved. And now you are free to become like Jesus. And like I've said before, like we talked about these last few weeks, becoming like Jesus is a process. It takes time. We might be good in one area but we struggle in another. Some of us might be really good at coming to church and praying with others and, and reading our Bible and, and being with God, sitting with God, but when we leave this building, I know for myself, if I step out of this building when church is over, when I've said goodbye to everybody, I go home, turn on the TV and forget that God came with me. God goes with me everywhere I go. And that the things I do at home are just as important as what I do here. As Christians, we're all in process on the journey of becoming like Jesus. And Jesus wants it all, but he also knows that we are in process. And God gives us grace so we can have a little grace with ourselves and with each other. I mean, imagine if you were just starting out playing piano. Imagine if you sat down at the keys for the first time and you're ready to play and your teacher hands you sheet music to play Beethoven's Fifth. Uh, Sorry, teach, I can't play this. I don't know what this is. Or they hand you, you know, the most complicated piece you could possibly think of. You wouldn't even know how to read the notes, let alone play the song. No, you wouldn't start like that. You'd... You teach the notes. You teach the names of the notes. You'd work up to playing those notes in succession with one hand and then the other and then putting them together. Heck, you teach them to read the music. What's, what does this even mean? What are this gobbledygook with these notes all over the page and flats and sharps? And I don't even know what this is. Likely, it would take quite a while before we're ready for Beethoven's Fifth this final trap that we can find ourselves in when we're working in this process, when we've decided to follow God with all of our heart and mind and soul and strength. The trap number four that we fall into is we have discouraging expectations. Like I said, the process of becoming holy, holy is exactly that. It's a process. I mean, if you think of the dial for volume, 
maybe in your car or on a radio, no one really goes from zero all the way to 10. I mean, if you did that, you'd blow out your speakers and probably your eardrums as well. You go from zero to one, or seven to eight, or four to four and a half, right? It's a gradual change. And if the enemy can't get a hold of your goals, well, he'll get a hold of your expectations. God, I really feel like I should be doing this well, and I'm just not. I just can't do it. Well, have you ever prayed before? Well, no. Okay, well, start small. God, I just don't know how to love people as I love myself in my business. I just don't know how to do that. Well, start small. See if there's something extra this person needs. A new client walks in the door and go the extra mile. Take an extra step. This gradual process gets easier and easier the more we do it. When we set out to love the Lord with all our hearts, our minds, and our strength, we're not going to do it perfectly. And there are many areas in our life that God cares about. And for some of us, we struggle with spiritual growth. We struggle with being in God's word, being in prayer. But for others, the struggle is simply following God's leading with our physical health or with our emotions. Where is God challenging you this week? What's an area where God is highlighting? Where are the areas that he desires growth from? As we go throughout this week, let's begin this process of loving God fully and completely and looking to him to guide us through our daily lives. When we leave this place, don't let the growth stop. Don't let the feeling that this isn't spiritual take over. Give it to God and watch him do some amazing things in the most unlikely places. Shall we pray? Awesome God, Lord, we thank you for everything that you have given to us and given for us. And God, we know that the the only response that we can give is our worship and praise. But God, sometimes it's hard to separate. It's hard to keep you in, in every walk of life, in every area that we go to. God, help us to keep our eyes fixed on you and in every interaction that we have, in every area of our life. God, help us to look to you as our provider, as our comforter, as our, our rock and our fortress, whatever we need, God, you are there. You are there. Lord God, we thank you. We lift your name on high and we praise you, both here and now and every moment of every day. We love you and we praise you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
Let us boldly confess our faith as we join together in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O oh Lord, we are so thankful to have no one in the hospital today, but we continue to pray for healing and strength for those in our congregation who are in need. We ask that you give them rest and that your healing hand would be upon them. Continue to restore them with your power, O oh God, and comfort all who struggle your presence. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, your Holy Spirit brings us new life and power to speak your life-giving forgiveness to others. Help us to lean into the Spirit's leading that we may bring others to your throne and encourage them in this walk with Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Faithful Lord, we lift up our sister congregation, Genesis Iglesia in Peru. We ask that you bless them and give them the strength they need to deliver your word to all who need it. We thank you for faithful missionaries who go out to all corners of the world to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. Be with all of our missionaries and with those who have been called by you to go and make disciples. Lord, in your mercy. Lord Jesus, once again, horrible attacks are occurring between Israel and her neighbors. You, Lord, are the Prince of Peace. We pray for an end to the violence and bloodshed, and ask that you bring a new dawn of peace across the Middle East. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we cannot name all for whom we wish to pray this day. Some are known only to one or two of us, and some are known only to you. Yet we wish to place them all under your loving care. So together we pray for all who are named silently at this moment by any person in our midst. Bless them, Lord. Surround them with your love and perfectly provide for each one. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Would you please join me in singing the Lord's Prayer?
Receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen, amen. to God.